In the uh, final part of the lecture, we shall be looking at uh, an important target for anti-diabetic drugs. And uh, we'll see a variety of different drugs that work through this mechanism, which can be grouped into two classes. They are either GLP-1 agonists, which is what we'll look at first. And these are very large molecules that are basically peptides. And then after that, we will look at uh, the inhibitors of uh, dipeptidyl protease, uh, peptidase, which is DPP-4. And those are small molecules that are rather different in structure. But the uh, pathway in which the effect is the same for both these families of drugs. And that's why we're treating them together. <clears throat> so GLP-1, which stands for glucagon-like peptide 1, is a human endogenous peptide hormone. So it's a peptide with this amino acid sequence, 37 amino acids or 36 amino acids, depending on which form it is. And this is an example of what we call an incretin hormone. And these are hormones that are produced in the uh, GI, and they are secreted in response to stimuli from nutrients. So they are basically produced uh, when you start eating, and they then have effects on various uh, tissues and organs around the body, as you can see. So they have uh, effects on fat cells in the kidney, in the blood vessel, in the brain too, so they penetrate to the brain, in the heart and the pancreas. And these um, effects in terms of uh, diabetes, the, the main ones are shown here. So the uh, hormone increases insulin production and secretion in the pancreas. And it has the opposite effect of decreasing glucagon secretion. It slows down the emptying of the uh, stomach. And uh, it basically induces the feeling of satiety that you're feeling full and then you can then stop eating. <coughs> and this hormone, like other endogenous hormones, is designed to carry a message specifically to the sites of action and it's also designed to self-terminate uh, rather than be permanent. And in the case of uh, GLP-1, this is a peptide hormone and it is cleaved by an enzyme that cleaves right here at the position between the second and third amino acids called the dipeptidyl peptidase 4, or DPP4 for short. And DPP4 cleaves um, GLP1 very efficiently to the extent that the uh, half-life of this uh, hormone in vivo is uh, very short, only one to two minutes. <coughs> So if you want to use GLP-4 as a GLP-1 as a way to reduce uh, diabetic effects, then we need to overcome this uh, high instability. And uh, in this uh, cartoon, we are seeing uh, what GLP-1 does in cells, which is a um, complex cascade of uh, signal transduction, GLP-1 binds to its receptor, which is a G-protein coupled receptor, coupled to adenylyl cyclase. And then that then affects a number of different uh, intracellular signaling pathways. But the uh, net result that's of importance for diabetes is uh, highlighted here. So you get promotion of insulin secretion, and you have uh, beta cells dividing and proliferating and you suppress their apoptosis as well. So how do we improve the uh, lifetime of BLP1 signaling in the body? And uh, a couple of different approaches used by different drugs that we'll be looking at. <clears throat> the first is we can modify the structure of this hormone so that it's more stable and less likely to be uh, destroyed by DPP-4. And shown here is the first part of the amino acid sequence. This is the histidine, which is position one, alanine position two, and position three is the glutamic acid. 
and DPP-4 cuts, as I mentioned before, the third amino acid, and it gives you this fragment of two amino acids, a dipeptide, and the rest of the GLP, which is uh, more than 30 amino acids. Nevertheless, removing that first two amino acids from the rest of the hormone is enough to uh, completely uh, remove the uh, pharmacological activity of uh, the hormone. So this uh, other fragment that you produce is inactive, and so is this tiny fragment by itself too. How can we make the uh, hormone more stable? Well, at the position that is cleaved by DPP-4, you see an alanine residue here. And it turns out that if you replace the alanine by glycine, that makes the uh, sequence more stable. So that's one approach that we'll see in a minute. Alternatively, if there is some way that you can prevent uh, the hormone from coming into contact with DPP-4, then the lifetime of the hormone should be increased. And there are actually drugs that work by this principle. They effectively hide the hormone as a conjugate with other proteins, either covalently or non-covalently. And we'll see how that helps uh, later in the lecture. And finally, the alternative to uh, coming up with more stable versions of GLP-1 is to instead uh, inhibit the enzyme that's responsible for its destruction, which is DPP-4. And we'll finish the lecture by looking at inhibitors of DPP-4, which then increase the lifetime of endogenous uh, GLP-1 levels. <coughs> so, one of the uh, first uh, medicinal agents uh, with this type of mechanism is uh, described here. And this goes to back to a natural product. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Gila monster, a lizard that you find in the desert areas of the uh, United States. And uh, from the uh, salivary glands of the uh, lizard, there were various uh, interesting compounds uh, isolated. And one of them is shown here. This is uh, exenatide, which has a amino acid sequence shown here. And this is the uh, Gila monsters version of GLP-1. And in this uh, amino acid sequence, the uh, amino acid residues shaded in magenta are the positions where that amino acid is different from human GLP-1. So if you compare the two side by side, the Gila monster peptide has only about 50% homology with human GLP-1. And these differences in the uh, Gila monster version of the uh, hormone are such that it, it becomes more stable. So firstly, at the position here, which is cut by DPP-4, there's a big change in uh, human GLP-1. This is alanine, and we have change that to glycine here, and that increases the stability. And in addition, there are various changes in the rest of the sequence, and these all contribute to a longer lifetime for this uh, peptide. And you can see the uh, dramatic difference. It pharmacologically has the same effect. It's again a potent GLP-1 agonist, so it still binds to its receptor with high affinity. But the half-life has now gone up to two hours compared to two minutes. So it's a significant uh, improvement and that allows it to be administered in very small doses. <clears throat> and this is quite a large peptide and you can see its molecular weight is over 4,000. So this is not a compound that would be suitable for oral delivery. So it's administered by subcutaneous uh, injection. And later, the uh, company Sanofi came up with a variant of this, which is similar to the uh, Gila monster peptide. And they discovered that if you add additional lysine residues, indicated here by the case, at the end of the peptide sequence, that was also beneficial for its uh, activity and stability. So this has uh, six lysines added, a hexalysine tail, and this is called the uh, lixisenatide. And this has a similar 
half-life compared uh, to uh, human GLP-1, it's significantly more stable and it uh, is even more stable than the uh, HeLa monster peptide and this can be dosed once daily. <coughs> the uh, Sanofi drug shown here is synthetic. The uh, HeLa monster peptide is produced by the uh, HeLa monster. However, the amounts that can be obtained from the natural source will be extremely small. So both these compounds uh, are produced industrially synthetically. And this is done by solid phase peptide synthesis where these amino acids are added one at a time to build up the uh, peptide. So it's quite a complex process, which means that these are expensive drugs to manufacture. We'll now look at some drugs that work by a different principle and that is of uh, trying to minimize the uh, interaction between GLP-1 and the enzyme that's destroying it, TPP4. And the first successful drug is uh, shown here. This is uh, liraglutide, which comes from uh, Novo Nordisk, who are a pioneer in uh, diabetes uh, uh, research and anti-diabetic drugs. And over here, this is the uh, sequence of uh, human GLP-1. There's the alanine, which is the position which is cut by DPP-4. And there's some key residues in red, which are important for binding to the receptor. So these are not positions which should be changed if you are trying to make an analog. And in the same way, there's a couple of residues in the middle here that are involved in uh, maintaining the conformation of GLP-1. So again, these should not be changed. But that means that there are various other positions within the sequence that you could modify to see if that improves its uh, stability. And this was uh, extensively studied by Novo Nordisk and eventually led to the uh, drug here, which as you can see, again has the alanine here as in the human sequence. So this should be under normal circumstances be cleaved very rapidly by DPP4, the peptidase but there's a couple of other changes. And the key one is shown down here. There's a lysine that has been attached to an additional glutamic acid. And to that glutamic acid, there's been this long lipophilic fatty acid attached. And uh, the structure in 2D is shown down here. It's a very large molecule. And this is the uh, histidine, which is position one corresponding to this histidine. Here's the alanine. Then there's the uh, position where it will be cut with the next uh, amino acid, the glutamic acid. And then you can go around this sequence accordingly. And when you come to the middle, that is the lysine residue, which corresponds to this K here. <coughs> and to that lysine residue, we have attached the glutamic acid. So that corresponds to this E. And then to that glutamic acid, in the drug there is attached a long fatty acid, which is this fatty acid here. And then the rest of the sequence to the end is here. And what is the effect of uh, adding this uh, fatty acid side chain? Well, as a result of that, this molecule is very lipophilic compared to the uh, parent hormone. And in plasma, there is a high concentration of uh, protein albumin, which tends to bind to lipophilic materials. So the majority of the time, when this is being uh, distributed in the body, it is tightly bound to albumin. And when it's bound to albumin, it's no longer able to be recognized and uh, cleaved by DPP-4. And the effect is dramatic. So there's no covalent bond between this molecule and albumin. This is uh, simply a non-covalent introduction uh, due to the lipophilic nature of this fatty acid. But nevertheless, it's strong enough that you can see that the uh, half-life of uh, this molecule, even though it still contains the uh, normally susceptible cleavage point between alanine and glutamic acid here, in uh, native 
GLP-1, that would be one to two minutes, but with this modified version, it's now 11 to 15 hours. So this is very nice and uh, this is a successful drug that can be given for once daily administration. Nevertheless, it's a large peptide. So this again is not a drug that's uh, suitable for oral and delivery, but this would be uh, through a subcutaneous uh, administration. And there are a couple of other drugs that work by the uh, same principle. This one here is the uh, GlaxoSmithKline approved drug. And in their drug, they have two copies of the GLP-1 peptide. And they have then engineered it so that it is covalently linked to albumin. So the previous drug from Novo Nordisk non-covalently binds to albumin in the plasma Whereas here, they have actually created a construct where you have one molecule of albumin linked to a molecule of GLP-1, which is linked to another molecule of GLP-1. So these are all covalent links and irreversible. And this, again, makes the uh, molecule resistant to DPP-4 cleavage. And this is suitable now for delivery once a week which is a significant improvement compared to the once daily. But uh, as you can see in size, this is now effectively a large protein. It's a conjugate of albumin with GLP-1, molecular weight over 70,000. And this needs to be produced uh, by cell culture, by fermentation. It's actually done using a strain of Baker's yeast, the uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. And it's an, again an expensive drug to be produced. And for that reason, Klaxo Smith Klein might uh, stop uh, producing it. And over here, you see the uh, Lily version of the same. And in their conjugate, they have two copies of GLP-1. And this is now covalently linked to an immunoglobulin fragment, the FC fragment of an IgG4. And this is also suitable for once weekly administration. This has to be made by cell fermentation, plasma half-life around five days, molecular weight about 60,000. And these different GLP-1 agonists are summarized uh, on this slide. So we started with the uh, more stable Exendin or Exenatide. This is the Gila monster version of the uh, GLP-1. This is a natural product, although produced synthetically now for clinical use. This is the uh, Sanofi version of this peptide, which has additional lysines added. This is a teliraglutide, where Novo has modified the human sequence and added this lipophilic tail that allows this molecule to be non-covalently bound tightly to albumin. There's another drug which I didn't discuss, which uses the same principle. This is semaglutide. And again, it uses a highly lipophilic tail that allows uh, tight binding to uh, albumin. And that principle is extended further in these two newer drugs, uh, albiglutide and dulaglutide, where we have now bound the uh, uh, molecule covalently so in albiglutide, we have the GLP-1 covalently bound to albumin, recombinant albumin. And in the same way, in the Lilly drug, we have the GLP-1 agonist covalently linked to an immunoglobulin fragment. And in the next section, we will look at the alternative way using small molecules to affect GLP-1 lifetime, and that is to inhibit the enzyme DPP-4 that's uh, responsible for the uh, cleavage of GLP-1. <coughs> and here again is the uh, chemistry behind the DPP-4. If we take a look at the uh, first three amino acids within the uh, sequence of GLP-1, this is the position that is cleaved by DPP-4 to give these inactive fragments. 
the uh, enzyme is cleaving this amide bond and if we want to make an inhibitor of this uh, enzyme then we would need to replace this bond that is being broken by the uh, enzyme by something else that looks like an amide bond but can then bind reversibly or irreversibly within the active site. Meanwhile, in the human GLP-1, the amino acid number two is an alanine, and it turns out that if we replace this alanine by proline, then the affinity for the enzyme is higher. And for that reason, medicinal chemists started making a lot of uh, small molecules that were designed to be DPP-4 inhibitors, which were based on proline. And one of these is shown here, so these are proline-like molecules with this five-membered ring that also had a cyano group over here, the CN group. And this CN group is an electrophile that can be attacked by the active site uh, serine in this uh, dipeptidyl peptidase. So the serine OH attacks the CN and makes a covalent bond. So this type of molecule is an irreversible inhibitor of DPP-4. And this type of uh, inhibition could be readily confirmed through X-ray crystal structures taken of the uh, drug soaked into the uh, enzyme and obtaining an X-ray crystal structure of the complex between the two. And in these types of structures, this is what we see. So here's the uh, drug molecule again, which is this one here. And Within it, you can see the drug is making some uh, reversible, non-covalent interactions with residues within the active site, like this glutamate, the tyrosine, other glutamate, and so on. But where this cyano group used to be in the X-ray structure, we see that's gone. Instead, we see an addition to the serine in the active site, as uh, depicted here. So the serine has added in then this adduct is now stabilized further by binding to the active site tyrosine. So this seemed like an effective strategy for DPP-4 inhibition. However, there was an issue that needed to be addressed. And that's a fact that uh, in these uh, ligands for DPP-4, these inhibitors, this is the uh, business end of the molecule. This needs to be attacked by your active site serine, so this is an electrophile. But for uh, efficient enzyme binding at the other end of the uh, molecule, we need a free amine, and uh, that makes uh, contacts with the enzyme active site, as shown here. But this amine is a nucleophile, and it's normally not a good idea to have a nucleophile and an electrophile in the same molecule, because then you have the uh, potential for self-reaction. And that's shown here. So we have an amide bond in the middle, which can rotate around. So this is one form in which it uh, sits, which we call the uh, trans rotomer. And in this particular conformation, you can see there isn't a problem. This is the cyano group, the electrophile. This is the amine, and the two are not close together in distance. However, if we rotate around the amide bond, we get what we call this the cis rotomer, and that rotation brings this amine group very close to the cyano group, and then this will react with this and give you this uh, cyclized compound, which will no longer be effective as a DPP4 inhibitor. So this is a dead end. So we need to keep these two groups in the molecule, but we somehow need to uh, prevent them from uh, talking to one another. And uh, there's two drugs on the market that employ this principle. And the way that the amine was prevented from attacking the cyano group was to make the amine very hindered. And by attaching the steric bulk, then you minimize the chance that it will then interact with the cyano group. And on the left here, we see the approved drug from uh, Novartis, Vildagliptin, and in this case, the uh, bulky group here, this adamantyl group, is attached directly to the uh, NH, and that makes this nitrogen sterically hindered and less likely to attack the uh, cyanogroup. 
And there's a, another drug from Bristol Myers Squibb, saxagliptin. And in this case, the amine itself is not substituted. In their drug, they put the uh, sterically hindered group next to the amine on the carbon. And it's the same sterically hindered group, this elemental group in both drugs. And here is just one carbon away compared to direct attachment of the amine. But that still gives you sufficient steric hindrance in this region to make it stable and not prone to attacking the cyanide group. So both of these are quite successful drugs. They are irreversible inhibitors. They are quite small molecules. So these are oral drugs that comply with the guidelines for oral bioavailability. Independently, there are now some drugs on the market that work by reversible inhibition of DPP-4. And this was the first in the family. This is uh, cetagliptin from uh, Merck. And the uh, drug originated from uh, high throughput screening for inhibitors of DPP-4. And uh, these are two early leads from the high throughput screening, which are not particularly potent but they were starting points for drug discovery and uh, many analogs were made of these compounds and it turned out that the most interesting analogs were the compounds where this portion shown here with the inhibitor on the left was then grafted on to uh, this portion on the right so they, they made some of these hybrid analogs which combined features of both these hits and those turned out to be now in the nanomolar potency. <clears throat> and because we have combined two molecules together, although we have obtained a more potent compound, the uh, size has become rather large now because it's a, a combination of these two smaller molecules. And then the question they asked was whether all of the portions of these molecules are necessary, and they pruned it down to the minimum needed it turned out that some of these uh, features were not necessary and they had nanomolar activity with the smaller fragment. And this compound was a potent inhibitor of DPP-4. On the other hand, it uh, was also prone to uh, in vivo metabolism. And the metabolism was suggested to be due to this uh, piperazine ring. There's a lone pair on this nitrogen, electron rich, so that can allow it to... Uh, interact with uh, metabolic enzymes like the uh, cytochrome P450 and lead to oxidation of this uh, position. So they then looked for improvements in the uh, pharmacokinetics and eventually the uh, drug on the market, you can see the uh, affinity for DPP4 has been increased, so the IC50 is lower. And uh, in this part of the molecule where there was a single fluorine, there were additional fluorines that will help in the stability. And then the uh, main change is down here. This was the amine that was likely to be contributing to metabolism. And that's been now replaced by a heterocycle. And so this lone pair is no longer available. It's tied up in this uh, aromatic circuit. And the... Uh, electron density of this ring has been further reduced by putting in a uh, trifluoromethyl group. So all these changes uh, help with both potency as well as the uh, bioavailability. And this has become a uh, blockbuster drug since its uh, introduction into the market. There are a couple of other DPP4 reversible inhibitors that again probably came from uh, screening exercises. This is one that was uh, disclosed in a patent by Boehringer Ingelheim and uh, quite active. And uh, this was optimized into another compound which was even more active, but then had uh, off-target effects. It also bound to the uh, human eater agogo or HERG, which is an iron channel and molecules that bind to HERG tend to have this potential for causing a cardiac arrhythmia. It's not the case that every compound that binds to HERG will have this effect, but because of the potential risk, normally in drug discovery, we screen for HERG binding at an early stage, and any compounds that will 
have this type of property will normally be discarded and uh, we try to make uh, replacements that don't have a binding because of the potential risk for cardiac effects. And in their case, they then came up with another molecule that did not have these herd binding properties, and this is the drug on the market, linagliptin, very potent uh, inhibitor of DPP4. And around the same time, independently, Novo Nordisk patented similar compounds. You can see this compound and the Thoring Engelheim compound are quite similar. And uh, a company in uh, California, Cyrix, took this uh, structure and uh, they tried to do what we call scaffold hopping, where they kept some portions of the molecule the same, like this uh, six-membered ring here, and also this uh, aromatic group with the cyano substituent. And then they tried to replace this heterocycle by other ones to find compounds with uh, superior properties. And eventually they came up with this molecule which again had uh, issues in terms of binding to the uh, Herg ion channel and uh, further analog preparation eventually led to the uh, drug on the market, Halog Liptin, which was uh, approved uh, and is in use in both the US and Europe. So these compounds as well, like the previous uh, DPP4 inhibitors, they fall within the uh, guidelines for uh, oral bioavailability and are used uh, orally. These are relatively new drugs, so some of them are still on patent, so they are not uh, necessarily cheap drugs. So we have seen that there are two different ways uh, of targeting GLP-1. One is to come up with an artificial agonist that uh, supplements the activity of the uh, human hormone, and we have seen different ways of doing that. And the other is to reduce the uh, destruction of GLP-1 by, by inhibiting the enzyme DPP-4. And regardless of which way we carry out this uh, intervention, these compounds will have the effect of uh, promoting insulin production in beta cells and also inhibiting glucagon production in alpha cells in the pancreas. These compounds do not have a side effect of weight gain and in fact often do cause some weight loss. They have low risk of hypoglycemia. The GLP-1 agonists are either peptides or large proteins in the case of the uh, conjugates and for that reason they have to be injected. Whereas the advantage of the uh, DPP-4 inhibitors is that they are small molecules and they are orally administered. Another difference between them is that the uh, GLP-1 agonists, they are designed to be uh, having a long lifetime, so they're usually subcutaneously injected, uh, and the, the, the better ones allow you to dose, for example, once weekly. But it also means that if there's an issue with the dose, then it will take time to recover, whereas the uh, DPP-4 inhibitors are normally daily dosing, so if there are any problems, then the dose can be stopped and you, the patient will feel the uh, effects uh, rapidly. There are some hints that these types of compounds might have a associated risk with the pancreatic side effects. <clears throat> now, to summarize uh, the uh, whole lecture, we have covered all the uh, different types of drugs that... Uh, used uh, for the treatment of diabetes. And firstly, there are drugs that work directly on the pancreas, and they do so by then stimulating the uh, secretion of insulin. So these are the drugs that we call insulin secretagogues, i.e. they promote insulin secretion. And this is a major mechanism for the drugs that work on the potassium ATP channel, in uh, pancreatic cells, so these are the uh, sulfonylureas and metaglenides. It is also a major mechanism of action for the drugs that we have just discussed, that is the uh, GLP-1 agonist and also the uh, DPP-4 inhibitors. Then we have some drugs that mainly affect uh, energy metabolism in cells, 
and in the liver they decrease the uh, production of glucose and this is a major mechanism for metformin the uh, first line therapy for diabetes and it's also an important mechanism of action for the uh, PIPA agonist like a uh, pioglitazone and these types of drugs have uh, effects in multiple organs within the body so in addition to this action in the liver they are also having a significant effect in uh, fat cells and also in muscle cells where they increase the um, uptake of glucose then you have uh, a carbose which is a very different mechanism this works in the intestine to reduce the uh, digestion of starch and thereby reduce the uh, absorption of glucose from dietary starch and finally the newest class of anti-diabetic drugs are the uh, sodium uh, glucose co-transporter inhibitors and these work solely in the kidney whereby inhibiting SGL2 they reduce the uh, absorption of glucose from the uh, kidney fluid and uh, reduce its excretion so that concludes our lecture on all the uh, diabetic drugs